Hello, and welcome to another Papers We Love. We haven't, it's, we do it monthly, but because we did uh, the last one in early September, and this is now late October, it feels like forever since our last meetup. Yes, yeah, I'm number 20th. Number 20 yeah. of all time in San Francisco, yeah. which is awesome. A lot has happened uh, in the past two months, so uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, can everyone give a huge round of applause and congratulate Inez for getting married last week? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone survived. Someone got married. Yeah. It's great. Katie and I picked up a new career in florals, and if you ever need that on top of, you know, distributed systems help, we're, we're here for that. Uh, the other thing that happened in the past two months is that um, a Papers We Love Slack was created. Did anyone join it? Show of hands? Okay. Cool. So if you go to papersweloveslack.herokuapp.com and put in your information, we'll put you into the Slack if you want to talk about stuff. Um, it's about 200 people right now. It's like all the different chapters across the globe, basically, which is pretty cool. So you, including San Francisco. So yeah, you can talk about papers and meet other people, and there's a lot. Volunteer for minis as well. I'm yes. looking for minis for next year. Yes. And... Uh, any other announcements before admin's trivia? Uh, we have the last two meetups, and then they're going to come up, and then they're going to be really nice. So just don't forget us. Uh, and then we can just actually get started if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, OK, fine. All right. Do you want to are you, uh, what? pass the mic around for questions after each talk? OK, so after each talk, we're going to have a mic so we can actually record questions, and then we can hear the questions. So as is tradition, I am going to introduce our speaker with his actual bio and something fake. So Jeff is a software engineer at Braintree where he works on the JavaScript SDK and various payment services. He's particularly interested in improving developer experiences, open sourcing all the things, and learning about programming languages that are new. Jeff is also a champion crossword puzzle solver. And has uh, and actually seen that in the in the competition for like the big big title uh, at the end of the year. So let's give it up for Jeff, and he's going to talk about the design principles behind Smalltalk. Hello, hello. Oh, that's that's much better. Okay, hello. Um, yeah, it's been pretty hard preparing for the crossword championships in December, um, but I'm still doing it. Um, so yeah, uh, the paper that I'm going to talk about today is called uh, "The Design Principles Behind Small Talk" by Daniel H. H. Ingalls, uh, published in 1980. I'm Jeff Carpenter, and I don't know how to advance these slides. And, oh, these, yes. Cool. Uh, yeah, I just want to say I am far from being a small talk expert. I'm not here because I'm a small talk expert. I just really liked this paper, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, I work on payments at Braintree. I'm an engineer uh, using object-oriented languages, um, and I just wanted to say uh, uh, I just wanted to take, take a second to say that I'm not not an academic. I'm a relatively junior engineer who was introduced to the the joy of reading papers um, via papers we love. So if you contribute to the repo or like Inez or Elaine, um, contribute to the meetup, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for all your work. Cool. Uh, there are two reasons why I love this paper. One uh, is that it's about uh, something that's not super hot right now, object-oriented programming. I heard a hiss when I, when I said that the first time. So if it's in uh, like a list of papers that you might read, uh, you might skip over it. Um, but I think it has a lot of lessons that we can all apply to um, any sort of programming. And two is that it is the source of a lot of paradigms we are deeply familiar with today, um, which is why I think a lot of stuff in this talk may seem familiar, um, because it's sort of, this is where I came from. Um, so hopefully the talk isn't boring, you know. Um, and just a logistics point, there are 17 design principles, and I will talk about 11 of them. Cool. Um, so a little bit of background about small talk, the language. In 1972, Alan Kay, Ted Cahir and Dan Ingalls were talking in the Xerox Park hallway. Ted and Dan were talking about how large a language would have to be to be the most powerful language. And Alan Kay disagreed with this. He said, 
No, you can define the most powerful language in the world in a page of code. So Ted and Dan were like, okay, prove it. Uh, so Alan comes in at 4 a.m. every single morning for two weeks uh, and works for four hours every day on this, um, this idea that he had for this language. Um, and this grew into what we now know as small talk. Um, fast forward eight years to 1980. Uh, Xerox Park released the first version, um, the first public release of small talk out to the public. And with the code and the language, they also released all these like interesting articles and papers about small talk written by the authors of small talk. Um, and one of them was this paper, Design Principles Behind Small Talk. Um, all these papers and articles were then syndicated into the August 1981 issue of Byte magazine, uh, which was comprised entirely of these, these articles and had this awesome cover that I just wanted to show you. Um, I'll let you interpret this however you want to interpret it. I will leave no comment. Um, one of the other papers was, is the small talk AD system for children? Um, just TLDR, yes. Uh, and I think this gives you a little idea into what was going through the minds of the people who created Smalltalk. Um, it, they weren't just thinking of a, creating a programming language that was for professional computer programmers. It was for, uh, they were thinking of creating a language for anybody to create whatever they wanted. Um, so on that note, I'll read the first uh, sentence of the paper. The purpose of the Smalltalk project is to provide computer support for the creative spirit in everyone. Our work flows from a vision that includes a creative individual and the best computing hardware available. So all these, I guess, now we'll go into the design principles and all these are in support of supporting creative individuals. It's so the first design principle, personal mastery. If a system is to serve the creative spirit, it must be entirely comprehensible to a single individual. Um, and I think the word system in this, this design principle is intentionally ambiguous because a system could be a language, a programming language, or it could be a musical instrument, for instance. Okay, how do you let people achieve, how do you allow people to achieve personal mastery through good design? A system should be built with a minimum set of unchangeable parts. These parts, those parts should be as general as possible, and all parts of the system should be held in a uniform framework. What kind of framework, you ask? A language. Um, a per the purpose of language is to provide a framework for communication. And this design principle comes with its own diagram. And this is meant to, uh, Dan Ingalls describes that this is meant to, dis to display um, the way two humans could talk to each other um, or to communicate with each other. There's the explicit communication, what I'm doing now, speaking with you or to you. Um, and then there's the implicit communication, which he describes as the, the, the relevant assumptions assumptions between the two parties. So um, my, like for an example, my relevant assumption or my implicit communication right now is that all of you are at least um, familiar with the basics of computer programming, for instance. He then goes on to describe that um, this doesn't have to be two humans. It could, it could describe how a human and a computer could communicate. So the explicit communication is the, like the screen and the mouse and the keyboard and the implicit communication um, on the human's part is our assumptions about how we, how we communicate with the computer. Um, and on the computer's part, it's how other people have programmed the computer to anticipate humans' assumptions. And a lot of the focus of the small talk language, he's, he says, um, is to improve this anticipation of human communication. And he says it much better. He says, since we must work with the mechanisms of human thought and communication for the next million years, hopefully, knock on wood, um, it will save time to make our computer models compatible with the mind rather than the other way around. And I think we all struggle with this in some way or another when we're designing APIs. Um, when we're designing APIs, I think we all have to decide where to fall on this line. At one extreme, there's what we want to do, for instance, like download dog GIFs. Um, and then at the other extreme, there's what the machine is good at, like executing assembly code, for instance. And it's impractical or impossible to fall at either extreme, but how do you decide where to fall on this line? Um, and I think what Dan Engel says and what the paper is arguing is that if you can find a way to inch left on this line, um, it might not even pay off in the short term, but it will pay off in the long term. And all this context sort of brings us to this very central design principle of this paper, which is objects. 
a computer language to support the concept of object and provide a uniform means for referring to the objects in its universe. So because humans use objects like computer, chair, desk, uh, com or sorry, because humans use those objects to communicate, um, computers should anticipate and use them too. Uniform metaphor is another design principle. A language should be designed around a powerful metaphor that can be uniformly applied in all areas. He lists some examples. There's Lisp, built, built on the model of linked data structures. APL, built on the model of arrays. Smalltalk, built on the model of communicating objects. And my question to you is, can you think of other languages that exhibit this design principle? Um, it's not a rhetorical question. I would love to know or like discuss it with you if you can think of any. Okay, modularity. No component in a complex system should depend on the internal details of any other component. And I think this might sound familiar to a lot of you because this is um, also known as encapsulation, one of the, the pillars of object-oriented programming. And this, this paper doesn't specifically talk about the pillars of object-oriented programming, but you, you may see as I go through more design principles that you might recognize other ones. Polymorphism, hey. A program should specify only the behavior of objects, not their representation. representation. Factoring. Each independent component in a system would appear only in one place. Uh, and when I initially read this, I thought of dry, or like the don't repeat yourself principle. Um, but Dan, Dan Ingalls goes on to describe that the way to achieve this is through, um, or the way they achieve this in small talk is through inheritance, um, which you might uh, recognizes the, the final pillar of uh, object-oriented programming. <laughs> I hear that. Uh, okay, so what, it, what, is, what do all these pillars get you? They get you leverage. When a system is well-factored, great leverage is available to users and implementers alike. Um, but I think something that we all, all are familiar with and that the Smalltalk authors um, became familiar with very early on is that there is such thing as too much leverage. Um, and we, I think we're familiar with this in the form of monkey patching. Um, and in the, in the book, Small Talk 80, Bits of History, Words of Advice, they have this diagram. Uh, it's kind of hard to read, but he says, in Small Talk, the user can understand and change system code. Here, let me modify array at. <laughs> um, and they also have this quote in that book, uh, Small Talk's incremental compilation and accessibility of kernel code encourages you to make the change while the system's happening. A bit like performing an appendectomy on yourself. <laughs> I'm not a medical expert, but I'm pretty sure that's not like recommended. Um, anyway, so next principle, virtual machine. A virtual machine specification establishes a framework for the application of technology. Um, and I think this, this influenced us today in two distinct ways. Um, one is that it influenced jo languages like Java and C Sharp to develop their own virtual machines um, in order to achieve portability. Um, and then in another way, because all the development of Smalltalk also happened in this Smalltalk virtual machine, it pioneered the, the idea of a, a development environment. Um, and we now have these integrated development environments like Xcode and IntelliJ um, that can draw their lines of influence to Smalltalk. Okay, so here's, here's the last, um, last design principle. Natural selection. Languages and systems that are of sound design will persist to be supplanted only by better ones. I thought this was funny because, uh, raise your hand if you use Smalltalk in production. So nobody, right, no, nobody today is using Smalltalk, um, but I think every single one of us every day uses a technology that can draw a direct line of influence to Smalltalk. So I'd like to suggest a correction to this design principle, which is that ideas that are of sound design will persist to be supplanted only by better ones. Um, and I just want to leave you with the last line of this paper, which is, even as the clock ticks, better and better computer support for the creative spirit is evolving. Help is on the way. Um, yeah, I, I think like supporting the creative spirit uh, was the focus of the entire small talk project. It's, it's pretty clear. Um, and it was made by extremely forward thinking people, as we all know. Um, and I think, yeah, despite it being about object oriented programming, I think there's still a lot we can learn today from this paper and from these people. So you can find the paper in the papers we love GitHub repo. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I'm Jay Carp on Twitter, or you can find me in person. And thank you very much.
Any questions? So, oh, you can hear me. So I'm going to be that rude person who doesn't actually ask a question but makes a statement. Um, I'm probably one of the few people here who is old enough to read that paper the day it came out. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of us who have moved on beyond the Javas and C++s of the world and embraced functional programming and new paradigms um, are not really aware of how revolutionary this work was at the time it came out. Um, Remember, we were dealing in a, in a world where Pascal was the state-of-the-art revolution and structured programming was the newest idea. The ideas that Goldberg and Robeson and Ingalls and everyone else came up with in, these, in, in this set of work really changed the world and changed the way we thought about computers, both in terms of how we model programming and also in terms of the agency of individuals to create just really awesome stuff. Um, and if we remember, if we look at this through the lens of its time and through the lens of what was awesome about what was, what came out in this, and we forget Java Enterprise Beans and all the, you know, and, and C++ templating and all the bad things that have been done in the name of object-oriented programming, I think we get a really different perspective on this than maybe some of us think about now. So that's my only comment. And there's no question, of course. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Oh, yeah. I was just uh, curious. This paper, I mean, uh, the thought of modeling things after lists and then arrays and then communications uh, made me wonder if Smalltalk had any, uh, what its concurrency like models were, or if it even has any nowadays. I know there's an open source Smalltalk engine, but uh, I don't know if it has any like different takes on concurrency since it's so like communication based? Mm, I'm, I'm not familiar with how Smalltalk does con concurrency. I think Vero is the, the open source Smalltalk today, but yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, question, how's Smalltalk doing today? Just out of interest. I, I mean, I, I know that the perception is generally that um, what could have been, but you know, is it does it have much of a footprint anywhere? I I, I just don't know. That's why. Wait. So uh, I mean, it yeah. Objective C is a marriage of some of Smalltalk's ideas with C. So. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. Obje uh, the a lot of. What they uh, what small talk is about is about um, message passing between objects and um, data encapsulation, uh, kind of objects all the way up. And I I'm not a C plus plus programmer, but yeah, Objective C um, kind of marries a lot of that with, of course, C. It's a strict superset of C, but um, so it. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's, you know, to the, so if you think about it like that, it's still incredibly popular, but. So I guess what you're trying to say is that it shaped the languages that we use today. So in a way, it's like it still lives, but it's in like, if you die tomorrow and you have offsprings, your offsprings will carry on your genes. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I don't think anybody here. I mean, I guess it kind of means what, depends what you mean by production, but I actually use it every day. Um, but I use it for debugging uh, because there is, there, is a, there is a small talk called FScript that's integrated with the Coco object system, and you can just use it at runtime, but it's a real, it is a real small talk, and I find it a better way to debug than uh, GDB for the most part. All right, no more questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, Jeff.
All right, let's get started then for our like main talk. One second, I have to switch my thingies. So Isol has many hobbies. By day, she works on a distributed build system at Google. For fun, she writes open source libraries in Clojure, ponders the design of systems that deal with inaccuracies, paints, and sculpts. Her curiosity for everything new and unexplored drives her to seek out cutting edge research papers. Also, she's seventh in line for the throne of Andorra. So if anybody's going to Europe and wants to help Isol get a little bit closer to that shed, uh, uh, it would be great. So I would like to have royalty friends that are in actual power. So, woo. so let's give it up for Isol. Oh. Hi, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, I see nods. OK, perfect. Um, very happy, very excited to be here. Uh, happy Halloween. Uh, yes, I'm short. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, happy Halloween. This is my tribute to Halloween. Uh, I'm not an S. I don't do those awesome slides where like you see the theme throughout the slides. So that's the you know the one reminder you're gonna get of Halloween. So uh, a little bit about myself. So um, as Ines mentioned, I work on a distributed build system at Google. Um, it's a planet scale, globally distributed system. It's super fun, and I write C++. People have been like kind of bashing on C++. It's fun. I love it. So, um, and actually, um, if um, we use stateful services, so Katie McCaffrey gave a talk at Strange Loop about stateful services and when they're appropriate and how to use them exactly. So we use stateful services. I'm hoping to give a talk at some point about our system, right? Uh, you know, ONG time, but um, I highly recommend Katie's talk um, because in our system, if a user comes in, does some work, and then comes in again, and they have a very similar workload, we may want to take advantage of some context that they established in our machines before they went away and then came back. Okay, so. Um, some other things I do, so I actually um, founded and run um, at Google Papers We Love, our internal small group where we read academic papers uh, published at Google and not outside of Google, and uh, discuss them, which is super fun. And um, in my spare time, I uh, maintain uh, open source um, graph algorithms in visualization library written in Clojure called Loom. Cool, so um, I gave a talk um, in, uh, at Papers Below NYC, which is actually how Ines and I met uh, last year, and I was on one VM to rule them all. I highly recommend this paper if any of you are interested in like programming languages, uh, language design. So what this paper basically does, like the 30 second summary is, it introduces Truffle Grail framework that allows you to write an interpreter for your new language, and then you get an optimizing compiler uh, for free. Um, and it runs on like JVM, and it's super awesome. There's actually a ton of different implementations already out. Like uh, there is Ruby um, written in Truffle and Grail. The Clojure implementation recently made its round. Super cool. And if you were there at the talk, which I don't think many of you were, there was this video that I shared um, comparing interpreter and compiler by bits and bytes. Highly recommend it. It's so entertaining. And like the whole series, just like, you know, I think they made them in like 70s or 80s. And it visits the fundamentals of computer science. It's super entertaining to watch because we've been so removed by all these abstraction layers from where we started out with. So. Okay, so, well, we're not talking today about Truffle and Grail and one VM to rule them all. We're talking about probabilistic accuracy bounds for fault tolerant computations that discard tasks. Um, so, before we dive into the paper, I would like to talk a little bit why I picked this paper. So, uh, the author of the paper, Martin, Professor Martin Reinhardt, so he taught my compiler class where we wrote an optimizing, uh, optimizing compiler from scratch. And uh, he, he introduced us to his research area, which is sacrificing accuracy for performance gain. And I read a few papers. One of them is perforating loops for performance gains. So um, it's when you, instead of executing every single iteration of the loop, you drop, like say you only execute every fourth, and then you do some statistical analysis to say how far off you are from correct answer. Well, it turns out for many applications, 
you're not going to be that far off if you're, for instance, trying to compute median. Um, it works quite well. So I got very, very excited about this. And so I did a research project. Uh, like I wrote my senior thesis with him on uh, sacrificing accuracy for performance gain uh, in loops that perform aggregation. Uh, so instead of um, syncing at the end of each loop iteration, what we did is we let the program run in wild, and then uh, what I did is I uh, created a mathematical model that allowed me to predict, given the number of threads that I have, and given the scheduler that I had, like which is dynamic or static scheduler, and then um, given how many iterations of Lobe had, how far off I would be from the correct answer, and if I could correct that. So it was really, really fun to work on it because there was like this constant struggle trying to explain results using the uh, computer architecture uh, and trying to like you know build in all these uh, different uh, abstraction layers that have been created and trying to have your research not be driven by you know what Intel decided to do next for optimization. So um, that was pretty fun. So. Having done all this work, I got really into the idea that not always do we need um, accuracy. We, like from very early days, we got used to the fact that we expect the computer will always give that you know two plus two is equals four, right? It always gives us the correct answer, and in many way, in many applications, it is important. Like if you're writing a kernel and your kernel just returns to whatever it feels like, you know, maybe it's not a good idea to run that. But for many other applications, totally acceptable. Uh, the archer you see here, she's amazing. Uh, she's from Murmansk, and she, I think, is like the fastest archer in the world. And uh, like, as you can see, she's not always accurate, but it doesn't matter because you know, if she's the one competing, like she can put a lot of ar uh, arrows in. So, um, and she's actually surprisingly accurate as well. So, the point is, like, you know, how good is good enough? How can we bound our arrows and talk about them in a way that we can, uh, we can discuss whether it's acceptable for us or not? Uh, in my system, for instance, um, you know, since I've been working on build system, if I fail to build some of the artifacts, um, then you know, the usual accepted uh, thing that people would expect is actually the whole build process fails. Well, if the user never actually requests to download those artifacts, so the user just never cares about them. Like, why does it matter? Like, I could just proceed. I just need to know whether they will actually care about the results in the end or not, or I should continue. And there are actually many different applications and problem domains in which inaccuracies are okay. A lot of them are in scientific computing, uh, but also outside of it. So Monte Carlo simulation, um, how many of us are familiar with Monte Carlo simulation? Okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, it does lots of random um, computation, independent trials with the varied seeds, and then uh, tries to figure out what the distribution looks like, what properties does it have. Um, another one is video and audio encoders and decoders. Um, MP3 is actually cut out the frequencies that your ear cannot hear so that it can compress it and um, encode it much faster. Uh, similar with Reed Solomon codes, um, when I worked at a semiconductor company, um, I created this automatic tracker of semiconductor wa wafers using error correcting codes, which looked like data matrices. And if the wafer gets chipped off, that's fine. Like, as long as it's within detectable and correctable range of arrows, like if you like corners got chipped off and we can correct for them, it doesn't matter. We move on. It doesn't mean that we just lost this wafer through the whole process altogether. And other ones are, you know, robust statistical techniques. Um, robust meaning tolerant of outliers, including missing data if we just fail to compute it altogether. And then another one is uh, near realistic visualizations, like all these, you know, aesthetically appealing visualizations we see. They don't always do, like do all the computations correctly. They just need to look realistic enough. If you're doing some sort of like you know collision detection, if it looks close enough, you don't actually need to compute. You could just you know divide it up into quad trees and then say, well, boundary conditions. We just don't care about them as much. We'll do our best to compute them, but otherwise, just move on. So, um, and there are many, many other domains that um, I'm sure I missed um, that could benefit from inaccuracy and do benefit from having inaccurate computations and then they can just run faster. So why would we accept inaccurate computation? Well, there are many benefits for that. 
One of them is latency reduction. So if we don't actually have to do the computation itself, then that means we save that much time not doing it, and we could just move on to the next thing. Um, similarly, we can work around small failures. So the wafers, they're very fragile. Like how many of you actually have seen a, a semiconductor wafer by any chance? Oh wow, awesome. That's, that's very cool, um, more than I expected. <laughs> so like they're very fragile, like thin things. Well, like depends on the substrate, like the substrates that we were using were very, very thin. And um, if it gets chipped off, like that's fine. Like we just move on in our uh, fabrication process. And um, it also being able to reduce utilization of computer resources uh, power, that's a lot of savings for us and our builds for energy. Um, and also being able to be resilient to software errors, being able to be resilient to programmers bugs where you, the client gives you incomplete data and then instead of just failing and t like rejecting the request or telling them like invalid request, we could just give them the best answer, maybe infer some things, maybe just dismiss that and you know, let them know that based on the data they gave us, we, that's what we computed and let them figure out if they want to retry it or it's good enough for them. So, I hope I'm sort of convincing you that you know, inaccurate computations are in a lot of different domains actually very helpful and help us um, gain some, uh, do have some performance gains. So um, on Twitter, I talked about how I might use Andy Warhol's art to give um, intuition. So how many of us actually read the paper? Okay, nice. How many of us read the abstracts and were like, okay, it's good, <laughs> I'll come. Okay, cool. <laughs> So um, my goal today is not to just recite the paper for you. My goal today is to give you the intuition for why these ideas are valuable, and hopefully you'll come away using some of these ideas and finding new applications for these ideas so you're um, in your own systems. So who, uh, well, I won't ask you that one. Who knows who Andy Warhol is? Okay, great, okay, I was not going to ask who doesn't know, and then that would be shameful, so. <laughs> uh, fantastic um, painter. He was actually most successful commercial illustrator before he became a painter, and then, be, uh, and then he became well known for his films. Very talented person, and I'm sure you've seen some of his paintings all over the world in galleries. Um, and uh, so, we would like to use some of his art, so we're gonna have a few iconic celebrities from like the 20th and 21st century. So Marilyn Monroe, Michael Jackson, Audrey Hepburn, Andy Warhol himself, the fabulous Whoopi Goldberg, uh, Oprah Winfrey, um, Charlie Chaplin, Johnny Depp, and the Campbell Soup. <laughs> so now what we're gonna do is, um, we have the problem, so we have a, you know, being a mutual artist actually makes a significant amount of money because being a regional one is kind of tough. And the reason I'm talking about art is, for those of you who don't know me, I do oil painting in a spare time and I love art, I love visual art, so uh, these are, you know, that was my excuse to just use some of my knowledge from the art world. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a map reduce, which takes inputs, uh, which are the original pictures that I showed, and then it will apply some sort of filter on it um, with undetermined amount of time that it takes to compute, and then the reduce phase will just compute a collage for us. And basically, we're under deadline. We uh, have a gallery showing in a couple weeks, and we need to produce as many of them as possible because we just want to sell them. And so, you know. We're in Me Too, War 4 instead of War Hall, and we're gonna use some of that fame. And so, um, and because if tasks can fail, some of them just may never actually succeed at applying the filter, then we're gonna use another artist's um, work, uh, Christopher Wall. Has anyone seen his work? Uh, he's been like at Guggenheim, Tate Modern. Uh, he's famous for these like block print stencil letters that spell out different things, and sometimes they're hard to read, sometimes they're not. The painting that he did um, that said, sell the house, sell the car, sell the kids, sold for over $25 million recently, so pretty successful, not my aesthetic, but um, you know, it gets into Guggenheim and uh, Tate Morton. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the panel, where now we have, we expect nine images, 
and they're gonna be pre-filled like this. So as soon as our task computes the filter, we're gonna add it to our collage. So um, now it's very important that Marilyn Monroe appears on all of the collages that we produce because you know that's what sells, that's what people want in their houses. So we're gonna add Marilyn Monroe. Uh, we're gonna start adding as our tasks are finishing computing and placing their results on the collage. Okay, so and um, so now we have our collage. We can you know ship it, move on to the next one. So now if Marilyn Monroe's image is missing, uh, that fails our criticality test because nobody would want to buy this anymore, even though it has all these other amazing uh, people on it. So um, now let's tie it back to the paper. So the paper talks about a criticality test, and it's one of the more important contributions um, of the paper, I, I think. So uh, criticality test basically allows us to detect um, whether um, the the failure of the task will corrupt data consumed by the next test block. So if you have a no pointer exception and then you can't use that data in downstream uh, in your program, um, that would fail the criticality test. And it usually refers to like wrong or incomplete data that results in too much failure, too much error. And we define too much, uh, the paper defines too much as uh, if 10% of tasks fail, and there's no output or computer distortion is greater than 0 0.1, then we consider that the task cannot be failed. It has to complete. And so now, now that we determined which task can and cannot fail, like with Marilyn Monroe, we can't fail that, but other tasks may fail, now we can actually start using uh, purposefully failing the task. Um, but before we get to that, let's talk about distortion. Um, so, Distortion um, is defined in the paper in the following way. Um, I hope you can see the color coding of the formula. So basically for each input from I through M, we measure the difference between correct output that we measure before, um, so we do runs where all the tasks have to complete 100% correct. And then we subtract the observed output when the failure actually happens, and then divide that out by the correct um, output for that given run, for that given sample, because we want to make sure that it's comparable from different runs so that you know, if in correct input in one case is 20, in another case is 200, like in the, order, uh, the difference is order of magnitude, that doesn't affect our results. We want to be comparing apples to apples. So now we want to do this m number of times, so sum up over all inputs, and then divide by no total number of samples. And um, if this doesn't fully make sense, like this setup doesn't fully make sense, I think it's less important than it is to like understand how that gets used later. And um, another thing that paper does is it computes bias, which is basically what you see here, but without the absolute value. So what the bias allows you to say is, any time incorrect uh, results are uh, acquired, it either skewed towards negative side or positive side. So like you'll either accumulate error or you'll be subtracting the error to be able to say whether you're leaning more to the right or to the left, basically. So now we use this distortion to obtain a model to be able to reason about how having run all these samples how can we predict that the next sample that is outside of our training set, how would it perform? Can we say anything about it without uh, trying to do the same thing over and over again? So we we'll use uh, linear least squares regression. Uh, how many of you here are familiar with what that means? Okay, several of us. Okay, so for a, a lot of you, it'll be just you know a repetition of what you know. Basically, what we're trying to do is fit a you know y equals a x plus b uh, line defined by that. Um, given the sample points in blue sample dots. And um, the least squares part is basically if we zoom in, then the difference from the sample to the predicted, like the fitted model, and we try to minimize the uh, square sum of all those differences. So this allows us just to say that we have achieved, you know, the most suitable fi linear fitting in this case. So now that's how we obtain our distortion model. 
So in this case, we have n fillable tasks. So each xi, like x1, xn, those are all the different fillable tasks. So in our case with um, the collage, workflow collage, that would be every single image, like each of the one, um, each of the images, that's a single fillable task. So for all of them, the model is sum of terms where each term is, um, so the least squares coefficient that you get by running the uh, linear least squares regression. Um, and uh, the confidence ba uh, interval uh, for the coefficients, specifically the paper uses 95% coefficient interval. Unless you are very skilled in stats and very knowledgeable, like don't worry about it. The, um, I will explain what these you know, good statistical properties are in layman's terms. Uh, I'm not a, a stats expert and I think I was still able to get quite a bit out of the paper uh, not knowing everything about the stats. So now the non-zero um, zero term, like so for C0 times uh, plus equals E0. So for that term, like we would expect that C0 will be zero because if there are no failures, then we shouldn't have any distortion. And as we'll see that in some models we actually get uh, non-zero terms. And that is due to having like different modes. So if you have you know, small task failures, you may be um, having bigger distortion than if you have large uh, task failures. So I promise we'll talk about good statistical properties. Um, so we talked about what linear least squares regression is. Um, the R square that paper mentions uh, quite a bit is basically the way you can think about it is how much of the variation on the data the model accounts for, like how much of it like, can it explain. And then confidence interval, all that means is that range of values of training set that is likely to explain the distribution. So like given all the things you haven't seen but you trained it on, how much of it is uh, likely to be explained by your model? And so 95% confidence just means 95% of the data. And then F value is something that also the paper uses uh, a lot is basically how well does the model explain the data? And you basically want it to be like in high uh, numbers, like orders of magnitude uh, to be able to say that it explains it well. So, so far so good? Okay, I see a few nods, okay. So now let's talk about the simulations that the paper used in its experimental data. So one of them was water, you know, which is appropriately named. It basically computes like the total uh, potential energy in the water uh, molecules by computing for each of the water molecules in the body of water. Then, oops. I don't know what happened. Yay. <laughs> um, let's see. Did it click? Uh, okay. Yep, there we go. Has a mind of its own. Okay. All right. We solve this. So water, we talked about that simulation. Next one is search, which is you know, very self-explanatory. It's actually about the, um, the electron beams being shot at the solid and then trying to measure how many of those electrons will escape the solid. Yeah, search, right? And then another um, simulation is called SOAR, which uh, computes how eddies and uh, coastal currents affect the overall oceanic movements very appropriately named as well. And then the last one, string, of course, is about two oil wells and trying to compute the seismic effects. If one of them experiences uh, seismic effects, how quickly that propagates to the other oil well through the geological medium. So specifically in the stream, like the two oil wells one, there is five tasks um, that the paper describes. What, the first one, shoots rays through the velocity model. The second one puts results into you know, some storage. The third task compares, uh, computes the new model based on the previously computed model. The fourth creates data structures that will be used by this shaded block that like, does some computation. And then uh, the last task will uh, just deallocate data structures. So when running the 
the criticality test, uh, what they found is that um, computing new model and creating data structures is one of those non-failable tasks. So if you fail them, distortion ha happens just to be too big. And there's actually a good explanation for them. So if you fail to compute new model, then downstream tasks in this pipeline will be acting on stale data, which may produce just, you know, just too much distortion, like incorrect data. And then creating new data structures will because those data structures are used by the downstream task again. Um, just not having them means that you can't really put it anywhere. And then the last one, like if you don't delegate data structures, you know, you're gonna have a memory leak, but it doesn't affect accuracy per se unless, you know, it explodes on you and um, because you forgot to keep deallocating um, memory. So, um, so let's look at the distortion models that the paper actually discussed and like sort of like see, like we saw like lots of coefficients, lots of confidence bounds. What do they mean? Like can we get intuition from that just by looking at the numbers and trying to reason about them? So one of them is taken, basically, this is like the C0. Like you see that it's a, it has a non-zero zero term coefficient, um, which actually is explained by the fact that when there's few uh, task, uh, there's, uh, the task failure rate is small, then it behaves, uh, it behaves more than linearly. Uh, so like it starts, you know, sloping up. And then when um, it has larger task failure rates, then it uh, behaves less than linearly. So, you know, when we do linear fitting, like that's what we end up seeing. Um, not quite at zero. So like if we had, uh, basically what this model says is, if we had zero failures, it would still not be, you know, fully correct. That's due to, you know, uh, our um, model construction. So now uh, we see some other coefficients, like 0.053, and 0 0.11, and then um, the last two. And these coefficients, they look quite small, uh, but these two uh, you know, indicate to us that if there's lots of failures in these two tasks, then that means that there's gonna be a lot of distortion. So like if half of these tasks, like if task three fails, that means like we're gonna have uh, like 20, uh, point 28, um, just of distortion, like roughly 28%. So, so that's what distortion model tells us. It tells us which of the tasks can create so much distortion that we should probably try not to fail them as much. And maybe like these tasks like, don't really have that much effect on distortion, so it's fine to fail them more. Now let's look at the timing model. Uh, so the paper introduces two models, distortion model and timing model, because what we wanna do is we wanna figure out where we're operating on this uh, accuracy and performance curve. And we want to pick the trade-offs we want to make for how much accuracy we're willing to tolerate and how much performance gain we're willing to get. So for timing model, uh, what we have, like the first coefficient being one, it basically means that it ex with no fillers, it executes in the same time as, um, as predicted. Now, with the uh, last two coefficients that we see are all negative, which means that as the task failure rate increases, the time to t execute those tasks decreases. There's one little caveat which is addressed in the paper. If um, this is assuming that you can just preempt the task and failing tasks don't take up any extra time. And there's actually one of the models, uh, one of the simulations that they do, it runs until the uh, until the computation converges uh, up to some point. So what they noticed is that there wasn't actually a decrease in time. Any time task failed, it took that much longer to execute this uh, simulation because the model would just run many more iterations until it, it hit the fixed point. So, um, so these coefficients you know, tell us whether we're actually able to get any performance gain from this or not. And then as we see here, we have two tasks. And one of them gives us much more performance gain than the other. So maybe, you know, it doesn't really make sense to try to fail a second task because failing the first task will give us that extra um, reduction in execution time. So this also allows us to reason about which task to fail. So one of them, uh, so taking from like the, you probably can't see and I don't expect you to, uh, the distortion in the time model so um, 
we just take it for task one. So the distortion has, you know, the following coefficients, and we can compute the ratio of distortion to time. And what that tells us is that, so we got 0 0.1 here and like 135 here. If we decide to fail the first task, we should be able to tolerate uh, like 1,300 times more distortion to get the same amount of speed up that we'd be getting if we decided to fail the first <coughs> task. So now we can actually start deciding which task makes sense for us to fail and which task doesn't. So this also allows us to do, if we wanna say, you know, given execution time, minimize the distortion, then we can run this uh, computation and figure out how, uh, how much time, um, how many things we need to fail in order to meet our uh, performance goal. And if we decide to say, you know, given this distortion, give me how, how much faster I could go. And uh, that would also tell us um, useful information. We'll be able to compute, you know, which task to fail, um, which, uh, failing which task will be able to get most uh, performance. Interest another interesting thing to notice um, is, so all these like coefficients, um, so in the distortion model, they tell you how much percentage of the program is failable. Uh, and how much uh, percentage of the program spends its time in something that we can fail. Does this from, uh, is everyone familiar here with Amdahl's law? Um, okay, I see a few nods. So basically, it, like, to me, like, that reminds me of Amdahl's law, where Amdahl's law basically tells us, given some parts of the program that um, have to run serially, and given some parts of the program that can be paralyzed, how much performance gain would you actually get by paralyzing them? So there is, you know, how much speed up would you get? Like, is one of the formulations. Um, and then, could we turn on the light? Um, is, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, cool. So, so like, it, the one of the. <laughs> nope. Okay. Well, I'll start writing for now. I'll just move it out to the light. How about that? Yeah. Sure. Right. <laughs> Could everyone look at your slides? What about the, the whiteboard? No? All right. Well, okay. So <laughs> I'll summarize it. Basically, um, one of them is, you know, given that you, like, there's a certain part of the, uh, so given the part of the program you are optimizing and you get some amount of uh, performance gain, this will tell you how much total speed up you can get. So like one over it basically tells you, you know, how much more you could do with, if you don't do one over, that just tells you like uh, the percentage of the original program, the percentage time of the original program that the uh, program will be running. And then the second one applies more to uh, when you're paralyzing programs. So like this is like theoretical grounds, right? Like there are many other factors at play that could actually make this much less than predicted. Like you may not get the speed up that And then, so the second one is basically, given the any number of processes or threads that you could paralyze it over, how much speed up could you get? And the, uh, so um, some part of the program is in, denoted by P is like the paralyzable part. And um, so if, you, if your program spends, um, if 90% of the program is paralyzable, then uh, what that means is at most you can get Like one over p is the um, total speed that the total execution speed up will get. So that means that you know just throwing stores at your problem is not going to actually make it go faster. Um, so it's a uh, very useful analysis to be able to do when deciding to paralyze uh, serial uh, computation. 
presentation. Okay, so, so we talked about distortion model, we talked about distortion, uh, we talked about time model, we talked about how they relate to each other. Um, another thing that paper mentions is Jade. This, uh, this paper actually builds on like, you know, years of research that the uh, team has been doing. So I wanted to mention, uh, how many of you are actually like, familiar with what Jade is? It's a meta language, there's like extension to C. Okay, so it, it, it could be interesting to some of you. So it's, um, it's basically a portable, implicitly parallel language. Um, <coughs> What you start with is you, s you write a program in a serial uh, imperative language, um, like in this case, like they write it in C, and then uh, you use Jade constructs to specify how to um, how the program will be accessing data, and then basically by specifying that, the program will be able to implicitly parallelize that for you by using this like with only construct. So here in with only construct, you would say, oh, I'm accessing you know like the sum shared. Uh, elements and like maybe a couple other variables and then we'll try to figure out how to parallelize that implicitly without causing any erase conditions in the program. So I'll handle the parallelization for you. And uh, as I mentioned, it's extension to C, so um, you don't need to learn uh, yet another language, you just need to like learn a few programs and like a few programs with like OpenMP or um, like Intel's uh, Silk things like, you know, similarly, it's just like in, in embedded into the language. Okay, so summarizing the paper, like what are they, you know, the benefits of doing, uh, having bounded inaccuracies? Well, so first of all, we can like decide to purposefully fail task if we, you know, reached our goal. So in our example, going back to our collage for the gallery showing, so we have, you know, we'll compute for a while, and then we see that, uh, like three tasks are still running or the three tasks haven't even been scheduled yet. And if we decide that having six out of nine is good enough for us and like that looks kind of cool and like has like its own aesthetic, then you know, we could just cancel those tasks and be done and like move on to the next collage that we have to do. And, uh, or we can just keep computing, but that's now something that we, can, uh, we actually have control over uh, to decide at the time. So, uh, in addition to that, we can actually have a simplified implementation where now instead of um, handling a lot of edge cases, we could just um, avoid doing them altogether. Handling edge cases often is like the most expensive part of you know, just developing your program and developing your system. So if we say our system is tolerant of some of the inaccuracies and just forget about those edge cases and you know, dep uh, like depending on how much time you had to actually handle and think about the edge cases, it's possible you, your implementation may not be correct, so let's simplify that. So that's one of the direction in which, you know, this could be applied. And then also, like, this is sort of like my favorite. Now we can focus on failure detection and repair mechanisms instead of worrying about being always accurate and spending all that much time trying to uh, wait for the correct answer. Um, have you guys, uh, and Gao seen um, Max, uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Mm, yeah, so like I was inspired by the fact that like, this truck just kept on going. They had some d g pretty cool detection of like where the truck needs fixing, but that thing just kept on going. It was ready to be on the whole time and like they only had to like drag it out once out of the, you know, out of when it got stuck. So like they had a reasonable system to be able to monitor where the failure is happening, then send the operator to fix that, and then just keep on going because they were being chased by all these bad people and you know, you don't wanna be caught by them. So, so I think that's a very important. Also, like, I find a lot of inspiration for these algorithms in nature, like the D DNA replication, um, like a lot of you I'm, I'm sure are familiar it just runs and tries to replicate, and then it has the uh, proofreading process in which it actually reads through whether it, it did it correctly or not. And if it didn't, then it just tosses that away and just continues. But this way it's able to, like, it already has repair mechanisms integrated into the system. So, or like a lot of my friends are P doing their PhDs in biology. They don't expect their experiments to work. They have reasonable ways to detect that the experiment failed and either redo it or move on with like the smaller sample set that they have and have that, but they don't actually expect that every single experiment will work because there's so many different things that could make it go wrong. 
So uh, leading to, you may have been hearing like about the uh, probabilistic programming where basically now you take all these um, assumptions that you know about inaccurate things, um, like for instance, like in medical diagnosis, tests give false positives, tests give false negatives. Using that or in um, building that into our model and now using that to be able to say how accurately can we predict. So there's a book that is coming out. It's like on early access. Uh, I just started reading it. I'm really enjoying it. It's called Prob uh, Practical Probabilistic Programming. I recommend it. Um, and uh, there are many references that I would recommend. So one of them, like if you're interested in G-Design and like playing around with it, I'll post the slides online so you can access the links. I highly recommend the papers by this research group, uh, Professor Martin Reinhardt's group. They do some amazing work, both in security and in uh, compiler design. Then uh, there's the, you know, the inspiration for, from biological processes, distributed information processing in biological and computational systems. I highly recommend this article. It's very, very interesting. It talks about how um, we could use the communication mechanisms that uh, different animals have, like bees, and then use that in our systems to be able to build message passing systems. Uh, then the paper I mentioned that I, I first read, like got me interested in this topic, is loop perforation. And then if you're interested about the confidence intervals, then uh, this paper explains it. I read it like, uh, it's, it's not a paper, it's a blog post, but like I read it like 12 times. Every time I read it, I was like, oh, I got it, I got it. It's like, it uh, talks about like tolerance intervals, and then I was like rereading, it's like, wait, what? So, <laughs> um, any of us here statistics experts in the room? Well, now I feel like I've set the high bar. <laughs> Having talked about how uh, uh, tricky the topic is, so yeah, and um, so I highly recommend start, to start thinking about how we can use inaccuracies and just move past them and uh, now detect how they get propagated, <coughs> accumulated, defend some of that, and um, instead of worrying about being 100% of the time correct, start uh, start worrying what we can trade off so we can just you know complete our computation faster and still be within. Uh, reasonable bounds of inaccuracy. So this is all I have prepared, but I want to open up the floor for discussion now because there's a lot of interesting ideas and I'm curious if there are systems that you are using that are currently already doing this. Um, if you have any questions about the paper or the intuition concepts, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was really great. Um, I just, oh, I should comment first. I, I liked the way that you deliberately made it very general. I thought that was a good decision. Uh, so I had my own observation. Uh, I, I sort of applied it to my own work, and um, maybe I'm over applying it, but I'll tell you what I was thinking about anyway. Uh, I was thinking about, so I do a lot of stuff with bee trees, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about how the perception still exists that, um, and this is certainly true, I think, still of MySQL. Um, an index scan uses um, what is sometimes called latch coupling, which is to say that y when you're descending the B tree, uh, you'll you lock initially the root page, and then you'll lock the page immediately below that, and you'll alternate in a sort of crabbing fashion. Um, and I think. A lot of people still believe that this is generally something that bee trees must do, but in fact it is not. Um, there's a paper in 81, um, it's called uh, Lehman and Yao. Um, they introduced a technique where uh, rather than doing this sort of song and dance with latch coupling, they can minimize or even totally eliminate the need for these latches or low level locks, these are kind of like semaphores or something. Um, and they can do this by detecting um, that a concurrent page split has occurred and recovering from it, essentially. Uh, now, it's not probabilistic. It doesn't involve statistics at all. Um, but I think given... Now, to be honest, I didn't read the paper. I just sort of showed up today. Uh, to, but it seemed like this would be something that would apply... that, that would, um, you know, come under the banner of what you're talking about because you're resigning yourself to having this problem and then detecting from it and recovering from it. And what I think is kind of an interesting observation on, on the way that particular technique works is, um, so essentially it 
has you create an, an item on each page which bounds the items on the page. So you can detect if a page split occurs and you, you can move right because there's a right link at each page at each level of vtree. Um, but in principle, you might have to um, keep going right a second time or even a third time uh, um, ad infinitum. In practice, this is not a problem. But theoretically, there's no, there's no limit on the number of times you have to do this. No, I, I, it's more of a comment than a question, but I, maybe I'm overfitting what I'm talking about. But it seems to me that it's surprisingly general. <coughs> this, the observation that you can do this kind of thing turns out to be surprisingly robust. And um, I just, I, I never sort of point this out because it seems kind of silly. But I, I, I really like the way you made it very general. Um, because it seems to... Oh yeah, well yes, that first of all, but but just that it was it was so general, because um, th the applicability of this kind of stuff is surprisingly broad. Um, yeah, I um, sorry. Did I go to? I don't know. Did I say too much? Did I go too deep? I don't know. Okay. Well, the idea is you detect a pa there was been a concurrent page split and recover from it, thus obviating the need for the latch coupling crabbing thing, right? So you get much better concurrency. It's much faster. That's so, the point. Um, the paper actually mentioned that, you know, yes, like this technique of like sacrificing accuracy, like so you can, you know, do something like remove like some of the logs is very commonly used. But uh, the thing that this paper does that is novel is setting some confidence bounds on it, saying like just that like within like 95% of confidence, like I think this is gonna be like, you know, within this bound of accuracy. So instead of just saying like, oh, okay, like now we didn't, do it or like, you know, having algorithms that just like, use fixed point as a way to uh, get to the correct answer. Now it just tells you, well, if you have this training set and now you have something out, uh, like some new input that you didn't encounter before, I can actually predict what answer you're gonna get. And I can also give you some good statistical properties about this answer that you could use. So like I work with a system that does like runs analytic queries and has like some you know statistical functions for instance like doing counts where by default it just uses a sample of 1000 and then it just you know doesn't actually run on the whole table and just gives you an answer. The thing that it doesn't give you is it doesn't give you the these confidence bounds on how close to the correct answer he thinks it is. And if I have, you know, billions of like, I worked on search infrastructure, so I had like billions of URLs coming every day, and I ran on like the default 1,000 sample, like, I don't know, like maybe like running a million would be, my, would get me close enough to it, but I wouldn't know how big of a sample size I should actually take before it's good enough, before I can say, well, it's within 1%, so whatever. You know, so just give me some like, you know, maybe it would be like by 90% off. Like, I don't know, like that's the thing that I think a lot of current systems don't do yet. Do they discuss uh, if there are like requirements on the distribution of the failures? Like you were saying, for example, say you decide to fail all edge cases or all cases that are taking too long. Uh -huh. um, is there a possibility that because those aren't uh, randomly distributed among all cases that that could bias the result and blow your confidence interval? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So like they talk about, you know, how much uh, failure in one task or, you know, like incompletion of one task actually contributes to the whole distortion by giving the uh, coefficients, right? So like if you had more failure in one failable task, 
it's more likely to skew and distort your results than some other tasks that you might fail. So like, they talk about like more generally, like on these simulations, um, they don't have the real systems uh, to test them on like, besides those simulations. So um, I think the coefficients is like the best bet you have like from the model um, on the failable test. Mm -hmm. Task dependencies. I mean, like, like they think that we saw it there, where it's like um, we have like a pipeline of tasks, right? And, and like the dependency on like the, the thing whether like your show in Marin is one row, and that would oh, like, yeah, that, I mean, right, right. Because I wonder like how much of that time is what you're doing on those, or whether oh. you're trying to assign them to actually make a build. But you know, because like that is the, the thing that is used in like really much more efficient and much more cheaper in run. Oh, I see. Well, I can't comment right now on my system, <laughs> but as soon as everything goes through, <laughs> I would love to talk about it. Would it be fair to say that maybe this is not completely uh, unrelated to something that you go in production and make it really ideal? Well, like, I think, you know, the, um, the goal of this paper is, you know, you test on like, however many mm -hmm. inputs you can, and then you create a model that hopefully explains the data that you haven't test, uh, trained it on okay. reasonably well, yeah. So, um, a little bit about like, uh, yes, question, oh, and then I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Oh, I was uh, wondering if uh, how something fails matters, like is this a, it succeeds or it fails, or is it like it succeeds, it got kind, like, is it probabilistic all the way down? So like, if you're, Failure is like you really kind of like ninety five percent failed, that <laughs> kind of thing. Like, does it matter, or is this like it succeeded or it failed when you're talking about failures? Yeah. So like uh, like this paper and like these models that they describe mostly just you know it either failed or it didn't, right? Like very binary. But uh, the paper does mention you know like you could assign weights to your different tasks, you know, depending like how much you care about them failing or not. So. I suppose there will be a next paper that they will do that goes more into detail about that. But um, yeah, definitely, I can imagine scenarios in which you know this task failing has much more rate of propagating the failure downstream and affecting many other results than something else. And assigning the weights to those will be more beneficial than like right now they're treated like always being you know equal in terms of their ability to distort, except for you know the coefficients themselves, right? That reveal how much it matters. We're gonna take a couple more questions and then we'll move this to a bar. Okay, yes. So I have a couple comments and also a question. Then. Okay. Um, so at Curion in Prague this year, uh, one of the talks that was given was um, about probabilistic programming uh, specifically made to be uh, useful to end users. So uh, it was a guy from, I believe it was Andy Gordon uh, out of Microsoft Research and the project that they had been working on was actually making probabilistic programming possible in Excel. Um, so I thought it was just really interesting because like it's like becoming such a commonplace thing now that like people can actually do this in fucking Excel, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, that is pretty cool, yeah. Second comment, which I would not normally make, but you actually explicitly asked me to make this yes. comment earlier. Um, so I actually have an article out in the current issue of the communications of the ACM um, on probabilistic algorithms. Um, so if you're interested in this stuff, please read that. Um, and the question then is, so this paper was published in 2006 and is incredibly interesting, and thank you again for the talk. Um, do you know uh, what, uh, like, is there anything uh, else interesting that's been built on top of this in the time since then? Uh, I personally don't know. I, um, I was hoping that the author, he was planning to come, but he couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, I, I know that there have been a few directions that they took it in where they try to model distributed systems where hardware failures are just like built into the model and built into the behavior and just expected. And then they try to model around, you know, just how frequently, right? Like based on like, you know, failure rates of disks, like, you know, like uh, all of that. I, um, I'm still making my way through a lot of those papers, but uh, uh, so unfortunately, I don't know exactly. But um, if you go to, um, the, it's like, so the team is at CSAO at MIT, and if you go to Professor Reiner's page, like he actually has like all the different publications categorized in, you know, specifically for security, or specifically for accuracy, like inaccurate computations and so on. So it uh, should be pretty discoverable. <laughs> Hi. 
Um, so I might have missed this in the talk, but basically, so with this model, you're saying like, oh, I can tolerate this much inaccuracy, and then I run things until I like they either pass or fail on that. Is there like an application where I can basically say I run for a certain amount of time, and then I'm able to calculate the amount of inaccuracy to like show my user? Um, because I think that's super applicable in a lot of things that are happening now. Where it's like, well, like I have like X amount of time to return a result or like X nodes respond in a distributed system, like is that good enough or can I just pass the like accuracy bound to the user and they can make that decision themselves? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, thank you for the question. So uh, the mo like once you construct the model, uh, there are a couple of ways you could use it uh, later. So one of them is you say, I, my target execution time is this much and then I will t try to fail particular tasks in a way to minimize distortion. And then you know you would be able to output you how much how much maximum upper bounds of a distortion you would expect. And similarly, if you say, I'm willing to tolerate this much distortion, try to minimize the time that I spent executing. So it's also able to do that. So like by using the model, then you can build on top of that by, you know, cr figuring out which task to fail at which tar uh, target task failure rate and use that on top of yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just a question over here. Okay. Okay. And then and then we'll go to Zeke's bar. Yeah. Great. Right. Sorry. Um, regarding the applicability, I wanted to say mm -hmm. about the thing called property-based testing, uh, which is basically uh, I think it's implemented in libraries like Quick Check for Haskell and Scala Check for Scala. Um, it's basically you describe some property that you say, okay, I, I have this function that I want to test. It takes two integers and it returns an integer, and I want this property to hold for this function, which is like maybe the result should be larger than both inputs. And it starts like, just fuzzing and supplementing all the different random inputs for this um, function to try to check if this property holds. Uh, I think this um, resonates somehow with the like the topic of, <laughs> of of the of the talk, um, I'm never used this libraries personally. I think, but I imagine that it would allow you to supply the generators, the custom generators for the parameters for your function, and in that generators you probably can choose the degree of variability of, like, what range do you want these integers to come from. And um, basically, how many times do you want to, ch to to run this function with random inputs to verify the property? And um, I think it's just like a very dumped down primitive application of that topic because like there is not a lot of um, uh, not a lot of application of you know like um, computing the accuracy and the uh, resulting accuracy of, of the result as well. But I guess it's a nice implication as well. So if you didn't hear about the property-based testing, then, then you might want to check it out. Thank you. And uh, before we conclude, can I share what I would like the future to be in the vision? Uh, so uh, so I worked with the compiler team, uh, did research and you know, doing the Tolerating inaccuracies at compiler level where the language is able to do those things like for performance game. So there's another great research group uh, at Harvard uh, with Professor Margot Zeltzer that tries to do a lot of those things but at runtime. So I would love to see at some point these two you know, approaches merge in creating this runtime and compile time, tolerating of inaccuracy so we could just have this you know, inaccurate world but very, very fast. Um, that, that's something I would like to see, and that's something that I've been thinking a lot about. So if any of you are working on any aspects of it, I'd love to talk afterwards. Thank you. Hey. <laughs>